Jean-Claude, I know you're back. I don't know if they can put you back on the screen behind us, but uh, I wanted to ask you, yes, I'm you're here. back here. Yeah. Um, you had disappeared for a while. Um, we, you, when we talked over the phone, you said that something that never happened in U.S. elections before was the theme of foreign <laughs> policy becoming of importance to Americans, and that usually never happens. But this time, because of the war in Ukraine and because of what's happening with Israel and the Hamas, <laughs> it has become a big um, challenge for the politicians. Can you tell us a little more about this, <coughs> please? <coughs> yes. Uh, traditionally, I would say there is a consensus between the Republican and the Democrat on foreign policy. And uh, I heard what some of the panelists were saying about the quasi-civil war in the United States. This is true that we have a bipolarization of American politics, but uh, this bipolarization is no longer just on domestic issues, it's also on foreign issues. And uh, let's talk about the Ukraine for, for a period of time. When uh, Russia invaded Ukraine a year and a half ago, there was immediately an overwhelming support to help Ukraine and not getting involved directly, obviously, in, in a war, but <laughs> providing massive support, financial support, but also military support. And uh, this military support has been overwhelmingly support at the beginning, endorsed by, I would say, both sides, the Republican and the, the Democrat. But over time, we've seen gradually less support from some part of the Republican Party. The Republican Party is not just one block. You have, I would say, the Trump minority. You have the traditional isolationists who are not supporting foreign uh, involvement, and that's led by people like Rand Paul. And then you have, I would say, the Reaganian part with Nikki Haley, but also people like uh, Tim Scott and uh, Mike Pence and so on, who want the United States to be involved and play a role, if not dominant, at least significant in, in foreign policy. That's until very recently, Biden has been able to get from Congress, both the House and the Senate, the financial help that he needs. And let's face it, you know, very cynically, you might say, United States has been benefiting from the war in Ukraine for three reasons. First of all, remember some time ago, your French president was saying, NATO is brand dead. I mean, NATO has never been stronger. That's one fact. And two major countries who had stayed neutral in World War II are now joining NATO, Sweden and Finland, which is extremely significant. So NATO has never been stronger. And the countries that are on the border of Russia wants NATO to be more involved, to protect them, because they believe that if Ukraine falls, they're likely to be the next target. So that's number one. Number two, the money that has been spent by the United States is coming back in the form of military uh, orders. You see, for example, when Germany who was not spending that much on defense, but Japan as well and so on, <laughs> where, who are they buying from? From the United States. So uh, they're not buying from Europe. They're buying from the United States. There are very few examples. So, and third, on the energy side, US, which is more or less self-sufficient, and Trump played a role for that, is now supplying Europe with the natural gas that they used to get from, from Russia. So the United States has been benefiting from this war from an economic standpoint and from a strategic standpoint. At the same time, there's less and less support for additional head to Ukraine, simply because this war is lasting longer than many people were expecting. And there is no obvious solution in the very near future. We know that Trump would probably drop to a significant extent the American help to Ukraine. But part of the Democrats are also now more hesitant. And one reason is simply the fact that we now have this war in the Middle East between Israel and Hamas. And 
again, there's no consensus on this war. You've seen people on the right and on the left being reluctant. Biden has been extremely supportive of the Israeli uh, counteroffensive on Hamas and the ground invasion in Gaza. But at the same time, part of the Democratic Party, the left wing part of the Democratic Party is now voicing some disagreement and Biden to be elected needs to have the vote of these people. As you know, I mean, there's no Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren running against him. He's unopposed from practical standpoint. It doesn't mean that he may not lose vote that could be critical in some states if the war lasts for too long and if the civilian casualties in Gaza become, I would say, unbearable. So we have a situation where, yes, the next presidential election in the U.S. could have significant impact. The question of Taiwan is very critical. There is a minority of people in the United States who would support an American involvement should China attack Taiwan in the very near future. But this is only a minority. The Americans feel in majority that they can only get involved in a foreign war or foreign conflict if there is a significant component in the American society that support this involvement. That was the case, for example, during the uh, Ireland UK uh, conflict. There was always a support for the Irish side on the American because of the large Irish community. Okay, so, so what the you say... uh, Jewish community in the United States, you're probably aware of that. You know how many Jewish people in the United States? 7.6. <laughs> There's more Jewish people in the United States than in the state of Israel. The state of Israel has a population of, of uh, 9 million people, but only 43% are Jewish people. So we are in a situation where there is, and in New York City where I live, one I mean, 1.6% 1.6 million people are part of this Jewish population. The Muslim population in the United States is three and a half million people. And the Muslim population is not just Arab. So there are people coming from Africa. There are people from, from Iran. There are people coming from Somalia and Egypt and so on. You also have 3.5 million Arab people. So, but in 2050, the projection is that there will be 8 million Muslims in the United States, which means that the Muslim population will surpass the Israeli population. Bottom line, I think this election in November might see some shift of vote based on consideration of what's happening in Taiwan, what's happening in Ukraine. But frankly speaking, if you watch American TV and listen to the news and read the newspapers these days, nobody talks about Ukraine anymore. We used to have Ukraine all over the screen. Now it's all about Gaza, Israel. This. And this is a real concern, I know, for, this, for the Ukrainian government. Because the uh, news speaker is pushing some funding, but the, is separating... Biden wants a package to support Ukraine and Israel, and, and the Republicans say, no, we should split. We should vote on the help to Israel, and we should vote on the help to uh, Ukraine. And we know why they do that, because they're probably not likely to support additional money for Ukraine. But it's interesting to see that, as in Russia, somehow the elections are going to be a survey of what people think, and especially regarding foreign affairs in the United States, which is something we really didn't have a big grasp on up, to the, up, up until now.